Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neil, and I'm joined by Charles Kyoto. Hello. Edward Kyoto. Hey there. And Stephen Kyoto. Whoa, great to be here, Neil. Yeah. You know, the Kyoto brothers, they don't just happen to have the same last name. They're actually related. <laughs> it's a fact. We're, we're real brothers. And we're not, we're not Japanese. We're, we're Sicilian Italian. All right. I'm half Italian, not on the Jones side. <clears throat> so I was talking to Charles a little bit before uh, everyone joined about how Killer Clowns was like blown up in the last couple of years, like this way more um, merchandise. And even the Halloween store this year, there was like tons of masks and yeah. laser guns. And what's that been like for you guys? Like, so many years later that like the movie keeps finding an audience and like <clears throat> i don't normally talk about money but like you know i guess you're starting to get you know mer more merchandise out there yeah, it's expensive because we have to buy it all um <laughs> yeah they don't get anything for free <laughs> that's a wonderful <laughs> surprise uh, something we never expected something we had hoped would have happened a lot earlier it seems like uh, the trend is kind of caught up to uh, the vision of killer clowns and found it's a viable merchandise item yeah, no, it's really cool seeing it out there. Again, we I don't think we had any real expectation it would be this popular this many years later. We always thought we made a fun movie, but after all these years to see the fans embracing it and now licensing all the merchandising is great. Uh, and it's it's cool to see the evolution of just the visualization of clown, new artists bringing a really cool and new vibe to it. Yeah, it's really it's really neat to see uh, thirty five years later the following that it has and it's growing and growing we have a fourth generation of kids being introduced to killer clowns from outer space the big fear was having crappy merchandise done <laughs> with thrill that the characters and stuff that's being created is high quality stuff well i think the visuals probably really lends to a lot of creativity for uh you know cool uh, merchandise yeah. shirts and, and figures and and laser yeah, guns. And we're, we're really excited about the game. I mean, that's something in our wildest dreams. We'd always envisioned the world of clowns coming to the video game market. But to have it happen now, so many years later, when the quality of the games and the interaction is so much better, it's so yeah. wonderful to see uh, Good Shepherd uh, Entertainment and, uh, and Terravision, Terravision uh, really created a, a, a great um, a great game, very authentic to the original 1980s film, captured a lot of the mood of the of the location, the clown gags, the uh, the interpretation of the clowns as uh, uh, CG avatars is, is quite fantastic. We're really happy. Yeah, yeah. With you know, again, and the, they've been they've been uh, peeking, you know, sneaking a bunch of images and things from the game, and it's just again their their, their mission was to make it authentic and. Uh, they've you know we're we're long for the ride as executive producers and uh it's been thrilling to see what they've been coming up with and just recreating the visual style of the movie but then the additions the next taking it to the next level for gameplay yeah edward uh is it uh a clown weapon week this week that was last week uh oh, last week oh uh, everybody yeah yesterday they dropped a bunch of images of the uh the clown spaceship interior oh yeah everybody we should let them know you should uh, go to, to twitter and go to killer clowns the game and is uh they're releasing bits and pieces of the game uh, over the next couple of months yeah it looks amazing and uh, how did that come about did you, was it something you guys sought out or did they come to you you know we had, we'd talked to mgm a while ago about doing some sort of a game virtual reality thing but it just it just didn't come to fruition at the time but independent of that um Good Shepherd and Terrorvision, uh, Randy Greenback, the executive director of the game, um, had you know he'd done Friday the Thirteenth. He'd always wanted to do uh, a killer clown game, and with the asymmetry uh, gameplay that he did with in Friday the Thirteenth, really kind of opened up, broadened his horizons in, in terms of what killer clowns could be. He always he, he's a big fan of the movie, and he always saw it as a game. So after Friday the 13th experience, he thought, no, this is the one. So um, Good Shepherd and Terrorvision approached MGM to do, to do the game. And then they brought us on as executive, executive producers for that, same, again, sense of authenticity. Yeah. yeah we yeah. like to think that it's different. It's, it's quite a bit different than any other game out there. It's a little sci-fi. It's a little horror. It's comedy. Um, it's a it's it's a good has a good family vibe to it. You can show it to the kids. 
Um, so I think it's a perfect game at the perfect time. Mm-hmm. I like the movie. <clears throat> Do you think that's you know, part of a reason why it keeps getting a new audience? Because you you could show it with your to your kids, you know, uh, if if they're cool with some wild stuff. And I think kids don't necessarily like to watch like a movie that they know is like a kid's movie. And uh, Killer Clowns is still, you know, horror enough that it's not necessarily a kid's movie. There's the fine line there. You're absolutely right. The kids don't want to watch kids stuff. They want to watch the stuff that the older kids are watching. So we're yeah, it's the, in that niche. It's the gateway drug. You know, it's the entry yeah. level of the primer for, for horror movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we, we see a lot of a lot of family. Again, like Charlie said, multi-generational now. We'll have, uh, you know, parents, uh, grandparents who showed it to their kids. And now those kids have kids. And we're seeing that three, four, five, six-year-olds that know the music and do the John Massari clown march, you know, in costume. It's uh it's a blast. They have yeah. themed birthday parties. A two-year-old is obsessed with it. He sang us the uh the the Dickies Killer Clown song, and they had a birthday cake and he had decorations. It was a killer clown themed party for a two-year-old. It's his favorite movie. <laughs> when I was two years old, I didn't know what a movie was. <laughs> Yeah, I probably didn't know either. So uh, I'm friends with John Massari on Facebook, and I was talking to him about the uh, the music. It's, he's composing the music for the game, too. Yeah, yes, that was yeah. really great. Well, again, that's the, that's the, they were trying to get it to, as authentic as they could to the actual 1988 uh, movie. Mm-hmm. So bringing in John's aesthetics as well as uh, us consulting with the visual styling and also the clown-related gags, I think brings it closer to what the uh, I think the fans are expecting. Hopefully they'll be happy and hopefully we'll gain a whole new audience. I mean, we had the horror and the sci-fi fan base, but bringing in the game people, I think it's going to help the whole uh, IP. That's the that's the the the, the main thing. We have the Dickies audience. They brought their audience in. But the the, the main thing is that we have something that uh, uh, um, that. We, we got people on the other side of the table that get it, that the first thing you want to do when you walk into something is go, hey, we got a great idea to change everything about killer clowns from outer space. And that's your biggest nightmare as a creator. There's a tone to it that you want to keep consistent. You can make it a little scarier, but you don't maybe want to make it a gore fest because there's far too much gore in everything else. If you want gore, there's plenty of stuff out there. You know, you know, the Ray Harryhausen films we grew up with, you know, they didn't have skeletons cutting people's heads off, but it was scary and exciting. Yeah. We're in that realm. That's where we come from, I think. Mm-hmm. And I think the contrast actually works really well compared to like the the mainstream horror genres. Like, it's evidenced in the uh, Universal Halloween Horror Nights. You know, the Killer Clowns was a maze again this year. Yeah. And, you know, we, we had the pleasure of being invited to opening night. And, you know, going through all the other mazes, it's really funny. They all have similar, you know, the imagery is different, but they all have the same type of boo cuts, people coming out at you, getting in yeah. your face, trying to scare you. But when you go through the clown maze, the the veneer is entirely different. So it's a, it's a unique experience in those venues. And I think the movie is, has a similar place in, in the film, you know, in the horror genre. It's just, it's unique. It stands out. It's a, it delivers on a similar level, but with a totally different cosmetic veneer. Mm-hmm. When you were <clears throat> like writing it and trying to get it made, um, did people get it? Like, did, you know, did they, did people want you to make it more of a horror movie or more of a kid's movie or did they just, we got very little it? input that way. Didn't we? Uh, no, we didn't get that much input that. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. Not at all. I think uh, uh, the people at Transworld entertainment that we pitched yeah. it to and funded the film, uh, they just bought it for the title. <laughs> they thought that the title alone was something they could sell to the to the marketplace. And I think their vision of what we were going to produce was completely wrong. I think they imagined we were going to dress up guys in white makeup and have them go around with yeah. with uh, chainsaws and, and giant knives. Uh, I think they were surprised at what we created. They could not have known, even from our pitch and the, and, and the, the artwork we showed them, they had no idea what we were going to do. Yeah, we, were, fact, we they, basically... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Again, when they took it to market at uh, AFM for the first time, they dropped from outer space from it. It was Killer Clowns, and I think on the Arrow release, you see that first their first concept poster. It's Killer Clowns with the giant clown hand squeezing a woman to death and blood oozing out. 
uh, that was not the movie that we had pitched or were making. But then, you know, during the course of production, we convinced them to restore the full and proper title, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Yeah, uh, prior to that, uh, clown maniac clowns, going back to the Lon Chaney's, were always men in makeup that had bad intentions or were murderers or escaped from a, an insane asylum, put on clown makeup and, and killed people. What we wanted to do is separate ourselves from that and make the clowns monsters, that they were not a life form. They weren't human in any way. They just kind of looked like clowns. So that was the point. And we're, we're thrilled that uh, we have, uh, we've made some iconic clowns that are going to be with us for a long time. Yeah. Um, once they realized what you were making, were they still on board or they were like, well, you know, what the hell is this? Or they Did were they gonna... care? <laughs> I don't think they cared. I think as long as we didn't go over budget, they were going along with it. <laughs> but we did have a really great yeah. Paul Mason was yes. one of our executive producers and he saw the film. He was a really good collaborator with us. Yeah. And I think it was at one of our, our test screenings. We had the film, we tested it. And uh, in the original cut, we had Dave the cop actually die, sacrificed himself in the big clown uh, explosion and and it, in the screening uh paul mason thought you know guys it's not that kind of film having it end on such a kind of dark note um he said it's it's more fun it, 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 rewrite the ending and we came up where dave comes back as stupid as it was it kind of plays with the title uh what do you expect from a film called killer class not a space and uh and it really was more of an upbeat more of a fun movie and i think it was a really good call so that was really the only note we really got at least the only note we ever took. Yeah, I mean, they 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 did want more like that test screening. They would want a little bit more clown mayhem. So because of that, we got more business in the drugstore. We got the pizza girl. Um, th those sorts of things. Um, I saw an interview with John Masari, and he said that um, when he first saw the first print without his score, without any music, like he found the movie actually terrifying. And then <laughs> you know it it becomes different when you add the music. So. Uh, did you guys realize that when you're making it or was there any point you're like, oh, maybe we made this too scary? Well, I wasn't I wasn't, you know, when we, when we were making it, I wasn't hearing any music in my head. You know, we were just concerned with the the, the visuals. Uh, the music does add a layer of emotion and stuff. So John brought a lot to the visuals. Yeah, but but I, I, could, I could say I don't think we are capable of making a totally scary movie. I mean, everything that we do is, is pretty much locked in comedy. I think that's probably our best expression. So even when we try to make something evil and nasty and suspense, there's always a comedic button. I mean, there are some scenes there that do go over the top into horror. The Big Top Berg was a suspenseful Hitch Hitchcockian type suspense scene with a little girl yeah. approaching the exit door. And then uh, the, the killer clown with his hand uh, inside John Vernon yeah. as a ventriloquist dummy, it does kind of top. Uh, you know, the, the horror point at that, sign, that time. So it really is a mix of, I don't know, horror, science fiction, comedy, and uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting you mentioned Alfred Hitchcock because, you know, what, what Alfred Hitchcock did for the shower, we tried to do for the toilet. And the, the thing is, um, in Psycho, you never saw the blade pierce the skin at all. So he was a master at creating the the terror without having to show gratuitous gore and i think we come from from that you don't we didn't have to show blood spurting out of the biker to sell the gag you want to knock my block off you know mm -hmm. and even I, during our special effects career we were offered opportunities to do yeah. some of the classic horror films in the 80s where they pretty much eviscerate women it's a lot of violence to women uh chopping their heads off and all that kind of stuff and we always stayed away from those as an effects company we didn't feel comfortable with that. I mean, if it was a monster killing somebody, that was okay. That was fantasy. It wasn't real. But some of the things they started shooting, and when you think about the torture porn they created later on in the early aughts, we just never liked that level of violence. We never thought that that was entertaining. All of us as a group, we just didn't see that as yeah. a, a, our expression. You know, mode of expression, yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, are you guys normally like kind of all on the same page on everything, or do you guys butt heads? Oh, no, yeah. we, butt, we butt heads. Uh, it's a, sort of the creative process, you know. Yeah, I mean, again, it's just uh, we, you know, a lot of active conversation about what you know, a director something, how something should go, and uh, 
But, you know, but it's all, it's all workable. It's part of the process. You have a similar enough background in both the entertainment we watched as a kids and growing up. There's a familiarity. So at the core, it's similar. But then the execution and the details of it, sometimes they're, they're a little different. But yeah, you know, creative, yeah, the creative collaboration, you know, any 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 musical group or any writing team, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a back and forth. You know, when it works the best, somebody has an idea and you build on it, make it better and better. And that's the way, you know, that's when it that's when it works, you know. So were you guys uh, we, making uh, your own movies as kids or your own monster stuff? We're oh, making yeah. everybody else's monster movies. Right. You know, we we see something on television, then we do our version. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at a lot of the effects guys and a lot of horror directors, you might yeah. find very similar backgrounds. The films that they watch, the genres they were really uh, uh, in love with, and the ones that made films. We've had film festivals, like little mini film festivals, with, with uh, some of our cohorts in the industry, and it's all the same imagery. It's Ray Harryhausen. It's yeah. kind of the apes. Uh, it, it's really kind of funny that we're all we all seem to be inspired by the same genre. Yeah, it's funny in the, in the, the ILM documentary that's on Disney Plus right now. It just it's so funny to see those guys. Their home movies are so similar to the stuff that we did when we were kids. Except Dennis Murens, his is still fucking off the chart. <laughs> <laughs> he was really good, even in those days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when Charles mentioned the you know skeletons and Ray Harryhausen, I still think that's one of the greatest uh, scenes in a movie ever filmed. It's the, the skeleton oh. scene. You know, I, I can remember. I think Charlie and I, my mother took us uh, to uh, downtown Radio City Music Hall in in Manhattan to see Seventh Ward to Symbiote at Radio City Music Hall. And to this day, I remember being there. I remember seeing it. And I remember the imagery. And I remember Bernard Herrmann's music. I mean, that film really yeah. made a mark. And then King Kong, seeing that even on a little TV set, the original King Kong, the 1933 version, it just stuck with us. And I think that film also inspired so many people, Phil Tippett and, and all, all so many people. So we have a common background, but it's interesting to see the different paths we've taken professionally and the different things we've done as creative professionals in our own our own films. Yeah, we're, we're actually, we're, what we're doing is recycling the stuff that inspired us and and things that we loved we're reinventing them we're putting our little spin on it to share with the future generations to be inspired and, and move on um it's uh it's it's part of the creative process and it's really exciting um the biggest thrill as a as as an artist is to um be told that uh you inspired another young artist to yeah. do what they're doing that's yeah, really I mean, exciting yeah. The Killer Clowns, uh, you know, it, it was emulating the movies of the 50s and the 60s that we love. Then you look at something like Stranger Things. Obviously, the Duffer Brothers, they're they're emulating the things that they grew up of the 80s movies. Yeah, the little uh, homages. There's homages in every every every. In fact, there's a there's a little Killer Clown. They license a little uh, <laughs> piece of music from Clowns uh, for one of the episodes of in Stranger Things. So yeah. it's a, we all have these little touchstones that we carry forward. That's what any artist does. They take um, all the imagery that they're exposed to and they creatively kind of mix it in with other diverse elements to create something new. I mean, there's a lot of sci-fi, like Edward said, 50s and 60s sci-fi movies, but there's also Mad Magazine, Warner Brothers, Looney Tune cartoons. Yeah. There's a lot of inspiration that goes in there. And uh, that's what makes it kind of diverse and fun and unique in the genre. Yeah, the Hal Roach comedies, Abbott and Costello, Laurel and Hardy, the stuff we grew up with. You know, like there was this there was a scene in Seventh Voyage of Sinbad with with Sinbad, you know, put uh, Princess Parissa and swung on a rope across the lava, you know, to escape, you know, from Sakura the Magician. Well, geez, I think uh, this guy called George Lucas had the same kind of thing when uh, uh, Princess Le Leia and Luke Skywalker had to swing across you know, in the Death Star. So, you know, even those guys borrow. I understand the 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 fight in Star Wars, the uh, you know, the 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 fight on the uh, uh you know the dog fight in outer space when they're being pursued by this the the stormtroopers was just lifted from a a, a scene in a, a a war movie, an Air Force war movie. A six you know? three squadron. Yes, yeah, six, six six squadron. So yeah, you know, it's it, it's what you do. You're inspired and you pass it on. Mm -hmm. Well, I think even a lot of some stuff in the spaceship and Killer Clowns is very uh, Star Wars like when, when they're in the Death Star. Yeah, well, yeah it's, it's all a little nod planet. to the things that are cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, I was talking to Charles. You, you, 
Yeah, actually, you, right? know, you mentioned the, the, the big top, the, the spaceship. Yeah. Actually, that's, that's a direct lift from a, uh, a, uh, an amusement park we went to when we were kids called Rye Beach Playland. It was an amusement park by the ocean on a pier, and it was a fun house that was a dark ride. Everything was dark, and it had all these fluorescent kind yeah. of fun type arcade type um you know tricks like a, a tunnel you go through and the entire end of the movie was really a, a black uh, a black room fun house so that's where that came from yeah and i guess the, the the circus tent motif itself you know i gotta say you know when i went to see the first Cirque du Soleil at the Santa Monica Pier in California i saw a tent on the beach and that was that was it. It stuck with me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was listening to a Grant uh, Kramer interview, and he said that he was going to play the character a little different. You guys were like, uh, Mike Tobacco's a real guy, and to play him a certain way. So uh, what was it about Grant that made him right, like that reminded you of uh, whoever Mike Tobacco was based on or inspired uh, by? His charisma. And he was a ladies' man. That was Mike Tobacco. Mike Tobacco was just... Uh, I. Uh, he was, just had this character about him. He would just be clever and funny and woo women. Uh, and that's what I thought Grant was. Grant just, he was good looking, but he had this charisma that was really engaging and was, uh, and sexy and fun. Charming. He was yeah. charming. charming. He was charming. Yeah. That's what we wanted Mike Tobacco. Yeah, he was very likable. And Debbie was really, you know, she was the, not your typical ingenue. She was an ingenue with brains. She was the one that said, no, no, they don't make cotton candy like this. <laughs> but Mike was kind of locked up in this fantasy. All he wanted to do was kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> sleep with them. <laughs> well, you know, when I look back on it, it's really funny. It comes from the 80s. And, you know, the, the thing is, you know, when you go out with girls, you take them up to make out point. You want to make out. You know, that's the point. That's why they call it make out point. It's so funny that I, I watch the movie now and I see Debbie covered from neck to wearing long skirts and long tights underneath there. And I'm going, geez, Mike's not going to have an easy time with this one. <laughs> you know, she, really on so she was very, she wasn't slutty. We, you know, Deb, Deborah came off. She was intelligent and smart. And, you know, she, she wanted to have an adventure. Yeah. Kind of before it's time having, you know, uh, like you said, the, the female lead is a, a strong, a smart person. Yeah. But well, the, the, you know, the biggest thing with, with Grant and then and all the actors was that, you know, as over the top as the concept is, you're in a real situation. This is a this is really happening. Don't uh, give in to the urge to wink at the camera. That you have to be in the moment. Yeah, I think that's the best comedy. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was the scary. that was the toughest part because everyone we we told the the idea to want to make it a joke, a parody, and we said no, let's keep it straight. And that was Stevens. You know, we had to keep reminding them. You know. This is really happening. It's a real situation. It just happens that clowns are doing it, but they're killing people. There's real jeopardy here. And, you know, you want to, it's so easy to go into the parody mode. Mm -hmm. Well, John Vernon's delivery is just, uh, it's uh, outstanding. And uh, he's hilarious in the movie and he seems totally on board. He's really committed to everything. Yeah. Was he on board like right away? Did he get it? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, it, 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 he got it. I mean, we wanted a performance like uh, Dean Wormer in Animal House. I think once he read the script, he told me, I said, John, you have any questions? He goes, no, it's all in the script. He got it. He knew what to do. And he was a great guy to work with. It was my first feature film director directing. And uh, he kind of sensed that I needed some help there. And, and he did give, give me some really great creative input. Like, for example, just people don't know this, there's the, the scene where he gets squirted in the face by the... Uh, by the flower in the jailhouse. And I did one take where the clown squirted him once and John kind of went oh, oh, like that. And I thought that was fine. I didn't want to squirt him again. Uh, but John said, no, let's try another one. Let him squirt me once, a pause, and then beep, another tiny little squirt after that. And that's the one we used. It was just a brilliant bit of comedy, just that little comic button at the end. It yeah. was really great. I think he enjoyed the, 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 the process. Some, some clown critics, you know, say, hey, you know, everything, you know, that the clowns did was malevolent and, you know, and hurt people. But how come the flower when he got squirted in the water? How come nothing happened with that? My answer with that is the clown just wanted to piss him off. Yeah, he's <laughs> teasing him. <laughs> yeah, that's it exactly. Yeah, he, he, had all the, he had all the plans for him, just the way that whole scene plans out, which is really where the movie kind of takes 
its turn. You know, if they're up to that point, up to the point where the clown walks into the police station, it's been kind of a, a light, frolicking, kind of fun, goofy movie. But when that clown walks in there, the movie takes on a different tone. And then when Dave comes back, it's really kind of full on dark from the rest of the movie out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you kind of touched on it, but uh, Stephen, was that uh, intimidating at all? You know, it's your first uh, feature film for all of you guys. You've worked on other things, but your first time, you know, directing. And, uh, you know, you have a veteran actor you know, that you have to direct. <clears throat> uh, um, interesting. It's the way, uh, how can I say? It? No, it wasn't. I, I, I was in awe of him. I was kind of nervous the first time I spoke to him on the phone asking if he had any questions. But once he got on stage, it was just working together. It, and I wasn't intimidated. <clears throat> he was just really great. A cooperative. His, pro- I, his professionalism, really, you know? Yes. And that, his professionalism kind of infected the, the, the crew. In fact, once he kind of protected me, we were working on a scene, kind of blocking out something. With I was working with him, and the crew was making noise, making loud, and they were yeah. making, you know, really being very disruptive. And John says, Hey, we're, we're working over here. Will everybody please cut down? And I said, Yeah, thanks. The AD <laughs> wasn't calming anybody down. He had a touch. So, he was very protective. He was a real pro. So yeah, you, you, I enjoyed working with him. And also Royal Dano was great. Yeah. You know, I'd seen him in movies, great movies in the past. And he was just great. That's when it's not intimidating. When there's no ego with the talent, they just come on down there. You're the director. They respect you. They work. You work together. And that's what both of those guys did. They were just great. Uh, yeah, you've heard... You've heard nightmare stories about, I've heard stories about Sean Connery and some other actors. They come in with an inexperienced director and they sort of play with them and toy with them and, and, and mess with them because they, you know, they, and, and they don't, they don't help. And I, I heard those stories and I was a little disappointed. It was, it was great to, you know, to have a professional, you learn from it. Um, it, it motivated the, the, the crew, uh, there was um it was it was a lot of uh, it was a very positive vibe yeah it's funny you didn't know like the marlon brando trick the great story about marlon brando he would show up on set and he would do it he would do a take you know multiple ways one way two ways and he knew which one he thought would work and it was a test for the directors see which one the director would choose so then he'd know how to whether he was going to phone it in or or no, let's pay attention. This is, it, yeah. I agree, let's do this. It's really true. And, and they, they're aware of how they set the tone. If he's if he's kind of prickly and you know unresponsive, then it kind of brings the entire crew down. But when you have a, an actor of stature kind of joining in, I mean, as silly as the movie was, he knew what the story was and he was a pro and he played it exactly the way it needed to be played. Serious, which was the tone I had wanted. It wasn't a joke. Everything, every incident that happened was a deadly incident, and he he was playing it real, and yeah. uh, I he let everybody know that this is a real movie, and to buckled up and 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 do it well. Yeah, and, and, he, he, and he kind of got it. You know, it was funny. I think it was the last night of shooting. There, he and I were were just standing around talking in between takes, and he said, "You know, he says, you know, this is really this movie's really gotten kind of got something." So, you know, I played that Dean Wormer. Got a character in Animal House and Animal House, and people love that thing. It's really caught on big, and you know this has maybe got that potential. And then he tried to lobby that the Mooney character should come back at the end of the movie in the spaceship, <laughs> which actually was a, a pretty kind of fun idea, good instinct actually. It would have been kind of funny to have him pop up. <laughs> hey, no, hey, kill the clowns. We could have made anything could have happened. We could have brought him back in, in any number of ways as a puppet, as a living dummy, as a clone, whatever, as yeah. a clown. You know, you know, so th- 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 all the possibilities were there. Unfortunately, you know, he's no longer with us. It's only been 35 years, you know. Yeah. Uh, along those 35 years, like, obviously, you guys are, are happy now because, uh, you know, all the, we were talking about this stuff. Was there any point in time that you were ever, you looked at the movie differently, like you were sick of talking about it? Or was it always, you know, something that you looked at uh, favorably? But for the longest time, I couldn't look at the film and really feel good about it. I mean, all I, I would see the film and see all the mistakes, all of the what ifs. I wish I could have done this. I would have could have done that. So it takes me a long time to really get over the, say, the production aspect of the film, to actually see it as a movie. But over the years, I've kind of adjusted to what it is, what we tried to create. And I think for what we want to do, which is just make a movie that we wanted to see, the kind of film we wanted to see in a the theater. And I think it was pretty successful in that in that realm. 
I mean, the and the creative process to to work, so you don't get stagnant. You should, as an artist, look at what you've done, and see ways to make it better. So the next one is better. The next one after that is better. Unfortunately, we didn't have the next one. <laughs> yeah, you know, again, it, you know, it, it didn't do well at the box office for whatever reason, uh, which there's there are several. But um, you know, the idea that. Um, we always kind of wanted to do more. And then, you know, trans world shortly after the movie was released, they had some financial issues. So they went out of business. So it, it was like a, a long slog to just try and keep track of who, who controlled the rights all these years and then get in front of the proper people to talk about, you know, possibly doing more. So, you know, it can never really went away where we were done with it. I guess if there's any one, like there's a single question, I'm sure we're going to get to it that we, you know, we, we'd rather not talk about it is about the sequel sort of thing. But, um, you know, not for lack of effort, not for lack of want on our part, but just, uh, the circumstances, um, have just never come to fruition. Um, but I don't think we've ever abandoned the movie, uh, cause there are too many fans out there. It's, it's, it's pleasant, to, uh, to, get to interact with the fans and hear what they love about the movie, what they hate about the movie. It's all entertaining. Do yes, you think and, and, the success, the, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Okay. I was just wondering, do you think if the success of the video game, if that takes off, do you think that would help the potential of a sequel? Well, we, we hope yes, so. Uh, we, we hope it will, because there's been this resurgence in clown activity. Both Funko has <laughs> products. Spirit Halloween yeah. has products. John Masari has got an album. Uh, Halloween Haunt at Universal, two years they've done it now. And the game, I think it's uh, maybe showing the powers that be, the bean counters, people who would finance something. Maybe they'll see now that there's merchandise, there's an audience out there, and maybe they will fund something in the future. Uh, that's what our yeah. hope is. And I feel they're taking it out of that cult classic type of stuff. And that now there is a mainstream following and opportunity here. Yeah. Yeah. You have that, that movie, Terror Vision. That was a very low budget horror movie with a clown. It made $10 million dollars now through They're word terrifying. of mouth and stuff. No one would have taken it seriously. It would have been a little, you know, funny little horror movie. It made $10 million. People are paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. Terrifier. So you know, the first one was yeah. real low budget. And it, um, I was one of the first people who had them on, not to tap myself yeah. in the back, but because uh, I, I thought it was great. It's completely different than something you guys probably like. It's very oh. violent. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the second just, one, it was only going to play like three days or something at the theater, yeah. and it just kept going, and people keep going to see it. And it's, yeah, like I said, made over $10 million. It's, well, they're a new category now. They call yeah. it me Megagore. <laughs> <laughs> it is. They, they said they invented a new category, Megagore. <laughs> that, that's a good sign that there's uh, there's an appetite for these kind of films and they could make clown films and that's fine by me, but nobody's making a film like ours as a, is yeah. a kind of blend of horror and comedy and sci-fi that we bring that is unique. Mm -hmm. It's Kyoto brothers. If the, you know, it's Kyoto brothers brand. Yeah. And I think I, people are responding to that. Yeah. And for people who don't even, cause a lot of my friends don't like the terrifier movies. Um, but, um, I think it's good for everyone who does make uh, independent horror movies because it's doing so well that it, I think it helps other people out, you know, with the possibility of getting theatrically released. It's interesting. Uh, guys, I, I we're thinking about this during Halloween. I look around at all of the, the knockoff, not knockoff, but the killer uh, clown masks and horror masks. And what everybody does is they've got their clowns looking horrific, big teeth, they're gory, they're scary, they're awful which is the antithesis of what we do with our clowns. Our clowns from a distance look kind of tame, like you want to walk up to them and be yeah. entertained. And when you get really close, you find out that they're terrible. <laughs> and ours is quite the opposite. Uh, if you look at ours, they're not overtly scary, like let's say terrified there. Yeah. It's uh, They're more tame. So there's a like a, a two-step process to the scare on our clowns that I think is pretty different. Yeah, yeah. They bring you in and, and then they uh, eat you yeah, or put you in, into a cocoon of uh, cotton candy. Ah. Who, who the funk? Right. You know? so How could you Mike, possibly anticipate that? <laughs> so a Mike Tobacco was based on a real guy, inspired by a real guy. Is there any other characters that were uh, inspired by real people? Funny you should ask. The Terenzi <laughs> brothers. So, <laughs> two good <laughs> friends of ours. Actually, we all hung out together. Mike Tobacco, Terenzi brothers, we hung out. We had these incredible adventures when we lived on Long Island back in the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, and they weren't as stupid as those guys. Those guys were a comedy <laughs> relief. Like they were in a different movie, the way they reacted to all the uh, stimulus. 
But those guys was always fun. Whenever you went out with Mike Tobacco and Terenzi Brothers, it was always an adventure. Something always fucked up happened. <laughs> it was always funny. Yeah, I mean, like, and so then, you know, like Joe Lombardo uh, was, my, was my best friend, you know, growing up. So, again, it's just the, the name was used. Mr. Myers, there was an actually a, a drugstore the pharmacist was uh, Mr. Myers. So there was a bunch of things from our our childhood that we just named people and places uh, after. Yeah, the Terenzi brothers, um, like the, the, if you know in the movie, you know, Rich and Paul, they were oblivious to what was going on because they just wanted to hook up with girls. <laughs> and that was, I remember when we went, used to go out with the you know, with the, 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 the Terenzi brothers, we go down to uh, spring break in Virginia Beach. We just wanted to hook up with girls. You know, and it was fun adventures and stuff. Nothing ever happened, but you know, there's you can't. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of trying. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Something yeah. would always they, they, happen, like it was Rich's car would break down in the middle of yeah. going through the hidden lake. That's yeah. really what happened. And then Paul at the spring break, maybe he lost his wallet with all his money in it. No, oh, Paul, you have to lose all your money. It was always something that just made. I don't know. It was is good buddies, good buddies of ours. Yeah, and, and Dave Hansen was a. Um... A, 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 a model, a, a well, yeah. a male underwear model that was a uh, a health teacher, gym teacher in our high school. Yeah, well, he taught driver's ed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. They used to call he him. The like used to call villain. him. Yeah, they used he, to call he, him Mr. Handsome. Yeah. yeah, he was the uh, he was the you know the hunk, the high school the hunk, hunk in our high teacher. school, in our teacher, our faculty. <laughs> no, when 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 Grant. Was, was was talking to the 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 Terenzi brothers and says, guys, there's guys, there's there's there's, there's clowns going around killing people, and and and, and Rich looks at, at at Paul and says, well, we haven't sold that much ice cream, you know, <laughs> so I guess we have nothing else to do, so we might as well go fight the clowns, you know, it's just it's so silly, so oblivious because he's disappointed that they they didn't get the girls at that moment and even when they were confronted by the clown girls when they fall in the pit with the balls are you debbie's roommates <laughs> that was the terenzi brothers question <laughs> did, did the real mike tobacco or the the real terenzi brothers had, had they ever seen the movie that you know of I, I know rich and paul terenzi have seen it and it's hard to really gauge their enthusiasm i think they enjoyed it i think they're flattered by it but i think there's like do you really think we are that stupid? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I tell them, no, you guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they've seen it. Well, again, it's a it's a funny name too, Terenzi. Yeah. You know, it's a, you know Italian. So. <laughs> yeah, you can't you make your friends who come to get you or something, right? Well, the, the the funny thing is, you know, the 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 rubber raft, which caused a lot of problems for sound and stuff, which is really we ha didn't anticipate that. But people say, why does he have a rubber raft? In, in the back of his car. Well, that rubber raft was something that, that, that Mike Tobacco had, and he and the Terenzi brothers went out on a uh, an adventure one night and got caught up in the tide and were pulled out. We had the Coast Guard and the police all on the beach looking for, you know, Rich, Paul, and, and, and Mike Tobacco. Um, when they finally, the Coast Guard brought them back in and they pulled the raft out, Mike Tobacco's dad was so angry, he took out a knife and stabbed the rubber raft so he so could never use it again. If you notice in the movie, we have patches on the rubber raft in a little Easter egg, personal little thing, you know, a detail that we put in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> No, uh, John also John Masari also mentioned that um, originally, like uh, the giant clown, uh, uh, Clownzilla, he was that was going to be like stop motion. Was that the original plan? And, and is there any anything else that like was just too big you couldn't pull off? Or we come from stop motion, we wanted to do it. Yeah, it was a little too time consuming and expensive to do. Uh, build a model, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to build everything in miniature and then the frame by frame. So there wasn't enough money to do that. But we opted for another one of our favorites, the Japanese, uh, you know, yeah. uh, kaiju. Yeah. Uh, Godzilla was a big, big favorite of ours. And we thought this was a really great technique. So it embraced all different effects techniques within our film and really was really was the best way to shoot it. We had Joe yeah, Viscoso fact. from Star Wars fame. He he yeah. blew up the ice cream truck and Charlie was in the suit. He played Clownzilla. So it was just a great way to actually top. It had a big yeah. uh, um, the big boss at the end of our movie. 
But when you notice, he's he comes down on strings, mm-hmm. and he was supposed to be yeah. a marionette throughout that scene. So we had um we had come up with this little apparatus, this little marionette rig above him that was going on it, but it was just a pain in the ass to to manipulate it. So like on the spot. You know, during the live action shoot, we abandoned that idea because it was just going to be too time consuming. And then when we shot the miniature, uh, the the clown suit on a miniature stage with Fantasy Two's parking lot, you know, that's when, uh, you know, we we came up with the idea that the 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 dummy the the suit would be stuffed like a dummy, lowered, and then Charlie was in the suit for the next cut, and then he would break the lines and then run down the the birthday cake we called it. Um, I thought that was a great scene. Even to this day, I think that whole end sequence is so yeah, great. Sure. It's a yeah. great effect that Gene Warren Jr. did on that. And then again, Peter Lacasse, one of the Terenzi brothers, you know, they said, "Go on, get out of the truck, get out of the truck." And his improv line was, "We can't. It's rented." I mean, <laughs> I didn't write that line. He he just thought of it. <laughs> and out of the moment, again, in the moment, you know, it's like. That that's the thing he was thinking of. <laughs> and, yeah, and they're they're not in the reality of the movie. They're just yeah. in the wrong world. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a good photo op, Charlie. If you have, if you if you could get uh, or maybe you still have the suit. I don't know. You could dress as uh, Clownzilla for a photo op. We have, uh, yeah, I have a, a photograph of it. Uh, the costumes, unfortunately, don't exist. I don't know whatever happened. The the uh, Clownzilla suit never turned up. Uh, oh. The one head. Uh, a collector has it. Somebody bought it. Um, but yeah, the I don't know what happened to the suit. Uh, the suit was uh, discarded when we moved from Glendale. Well, maybe someone uh, has it out there. Oh. Yeah, no, it's in <laughs> it's gone. In a, in a it's in a dump somewhere. Ah. You mentioned, uh, you know, it didn't do well when it first was released. But when did you when did you guys start to know, like, there is a following for Killer Clowns? You know what? It, it was always uh, we saw it, you know, when it was released on uh, home video. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very it was very popular. Um, it, we, we got that feeling. Um, we had cele- we had uh, uh, Frank Darabont told us that he'd love Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Penn and Teller said they ran out to see it when they heard of it uh, on on Broadway in New York City. So we got a feeling that we had done something right. Yeah, but it was when it hit when it came when it hit HBO and USA Network is when yeah. it really kind of started to really kind of permeate the you know the uh, the pop culture. But even then we had no idea how how big it might be or how small it could be until uh, the uh, the horror convention circuit we started attending some of those things and so many people came up to us saying they loved the film. And I think we started to get a, like an in-person feeling for how many people enjoyed the film. But I think only until recently, I think it was Funko and and some of the, the products that were coming out. There's always been t-shirts, mm-hmm. but all of a sudden there's this big resurgence in clowns and it's like bigger than I ever imagined it would be. And we've now yeah, traveled so to so Texas and Ohio and Pennsylvania. And yeah. there's fans all over the country. And even in Europe, we hear from military people that say, oh, they were stationed in Germany. And on Halloween, they would show that film and they would do it was like a big, big deal in Germany. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, Soda Claus was the first one to do like an action figure, uh, you know, of it. Oh, and they yeah. did the shorty yeah. character. And that was like 2005. Prior to that, it had been T-shirts, um, Dark, uh, Dark Studios had some masks or Death Studios, would, uh, they had masks, but that was it. But then, like in the last five, six years, it's really kind of yeah. really taken off. Yeah, the merchandise, the original uh, action figures that, that were done uh, are going for three and six hundred dollars now, you know, because they're they were a limited edition. Um, so they're, they're very sought after. Um, the um, the the fact that it was, um, uh, on uh, you know on, on HBO was good. Oh, the fact that it was in the video stores. A lot of fans through the years have told me, you know what? We'd walk into the in, in into the video store and we'd see the cover, and that was the one we had to have the title: "Kill the Clowns from Outer Space" and the clown on it. You know, uh, the original poster. They said that was just an eye catcher, and they would grab it based on that, just from the title. So um, you know. 
uh, home video was very important. That brought it into people's homes. That allowed young children to see it because once it's in the house, the family is showing it. Yeah, there's a couple of curse words in it, but, you know, that that, that was palatable, I guess. Yeah. And then I guess the biggest thing was when uh, 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 Maggie, who was working, she was working in our art department, also worked at MGM, and she heard that they were going to put out a DVD after they had done the Midnight Madness and Killer Clowns had uh, headlined the uh, the VHS series Midnight Madness, uh, she suggested, hey, these guys are great. They did a lot of neat work. You should do supplemental material. So they had a supplemental disc. And I think that was a, a, a big uh, attraction to the fan base. Yeah. So I MGM a lot of- did a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I might either you're watching on VHS for the first time or HBO, but I remember being on uh, TV a lot uh, when I was uh, probably my late teens, I guess, early 20s. Yeah, USA Cable ran it for a long time. It really, yeah. really showed the hell out of it. And then for the longest time, it done, it disappeared. Media, <clears throat> home, en- yeah. Media home Entertainment, who got the video rights after Transworld disappeared, Media Home Entertainment videos, and they disappeared so for the longest time it wasn't available the only copy you can get was a the spanish language version (laughs) people were stealing it from blockbuster you couldn't get it if they had one copy people would rent it and steal it yeah Yeah. (laughs) in fact Um, i think it was an auction an original vhs from the 80s went for twenty six hundred dollars oh wow recently right yeah Yeah. like like last week yeah (laughs) You guys don't have any stored away or anything. No, oh. I do. I have. Uh, I've never <laughs> opened them. <laughs> I have a bunch. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> if you if you ever strapped for cash, you can uh, <laughs> put them up on eBay. Yeah. Twenty six hundred a pop. Uh, so I got a lot of questions here on social media. When I announced you guys were coming on, if you don't mind answering them. Uh, uh, let's see. Andy Cartner, were the Dickies the first band you approached to write the opening song? It was the, the only, only band we approached. <laughs> but it wasn't us who got them involved. Yeah. Oh, really? We had a music yeah. supervisor who knew of the Dickies, passed along the title of the song with, I guess, a very minor explanation, but it was mostly just the title. And the guys came back with that song. We heard it once and said, absolutely perfect. I just, it was so right on. It was 80s, so it had that punk vibe to it. It was kind of carnival-esque, but not overbearing. Uh, it was a great balance, and it kind of encapsulated the kind of tone we wanted in the movie, but actually brought it to a whole new audience. So we were very happy. Uh, that was a good one. AJ Zyla, uh, the pie scene was one of my favorites next to uh, the shadow puppets. Um, what, what, are, what are the most popular scenes when you're at conventions and people come up to you? Everybody. Loves everybody, shorty or tiny, yeah. whatever they call and Hands them. down, that's the most popular clown, and yeah. as a result, that scene is there probably the consensus yeah. fan. What are you thing. gonna do? Knock my block off? I say, don't ask a clown a question like that. <laughs> it seems to be a fan favorite. I think because maybe there's a little bit of uh, they feel sorry for him. He's a little guy being picked on, and <laughs> uh, and he kind of uh, gets his comeuppance. Uh, I think that's why. And you're right, that, that's the shadow gag's another uh, another good one too. It's my favorite sequence in the film. And, and a lot of people like the the the, the bur- big top burger clown, the hammer. <laughs> they like that scene. Those are the ones that uh, yeah. And we do learn you know, we, we do learn questions not to ask. Like you never ask a clown, what are you gonna do with those pies, boys? Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't like the answer. No, I don't think I've ever seen Death by Pie fight before. <laughs> no. And well, that's the funny story. The, uh, uh, the Three Stooges pie fights and uh, yeah. Soupy Sales, a very famous uh, kitty show host on the East Coast. Yeah. And that, that was, was nice. nice. <laughs> that was the thing we wanted. We told Transworld we wanted to get we wanted to get Soupy Sales. We wanted to get Soupy Sales, you know, to, to throw the pies. And no, we no, made him be, an offer. Be the he said he was going to do it for $10,000 for a day. He was going to fly out and, and, and teach us all how to throw pies and be the security <laughs> guard. Transworld didn't know who Soupy Sales was. Why do you have oh, to really? get this guy? Yeah. <laughs> that would have been very fun. Yeah. You know who Soupy Sales is, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. 
Well, Again, a big influence, a big influence as a kid, you know, watching Soupy Sales and Pookie and Hippie and just the, the brand of old school comedy that he had. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, by the way, just real quick, you guys brought up Ray Harryhausen a lot. And there, when I first started the show, he was one of the first guests I tried a lot to get on and it almost happened. It never did. But I regret not uh, being more persistent. Uh, no, Ray's a really great guy. I mean, you think about his career. He was a behind the scenes kind of guy. But the fan base knew him. These were his films. They were Ray Harryhausen films. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, after he retired, he was just going around the world, just kind of sucking up everybody's adoration. And it was, must have been a really great final round for him to actually go and see how he affected people. Uh, yeah. He was a really sweet guy, really great artist. Uh, Ken Meehan, can you break down the mechanics behind the large Marge transformation in Pee Wee's Big Adventure? <laughs> Break down the mechanics. Meaning, you want us to kind of reveal all the secrets and <laughs> More, ruin the effect? <laughs> yeah, he was like like a magician revealing your trick oh. here. Yeah. Well, there were two sequences. Two sequences had to be done, right? You know, oh, Tim yeah, had yeah. I was working with uh, Rick uh, Rick Heinrichs, who was contracting the the animation effects through, uh, at Warner Brothers for, for Tim's film. And it was a T Rex scene with the animated dinosaur, and then there was Large Marge. And I said, "Oh, I, I, he asked me what I wanted to do," and I said, "Oh, I'd like to do the." Uh, the dinosaur scene. He goes, oh, no, I want to do that. So I said, shit. I said, now we have to figure out how the hell are we going to do this large marge effect? So I think we, we all put our heads together and came up with, uh, we made a head casting of Alice Nunn, the actress. We made a mold. And then we poured clay inside. So we had a clay casting of the actress. And then we put these replacement eyes that would go from a normal size eyes to these big, big bulging eyes as what, in single frame increments. Mm-hmm. And then we took her wig that the actress used in the show. And we used her wardrobe. We tried to bring as many real elements that was used by the actress and put them on the puppet. And the final, the final detail was we brought a makeup artist in, yeah. Anita Haven, to come in and actually put the makeup that was on the actress. She put that same makeup on the skin of the clay. Yeah, so and then all well, that was mounted on a uh, a little small car scissor jack uh, that would allow her to shrug her shoulders. Shoulders up and down. And then it was just your classic frame-by-frame animation. I sculpted the thing over 12 hours and created the animated sequence. That was, what, 15 frames total? Well, the actual transformation was about 12 frames. But then there was the beginning of it that was cut out, which took me probably the (laughs) longest amount of time, maintaining the integrity of the original sculpt to make it look like she's human. But all in all, it was a really great scene that Tim put together. The build-up, the suspense, and then the punchline. It, I think we we're very fortunate to have done that shot in what is an iconic element of a really cool film. And it yeah, became and like okay. it became a thing. It, it, yeah. you know, Tim invented the large Marge shot. So when you have transitions like that, it becomes the large Marge type shot. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, Stephen mentioned that, you know, part of it was cut out. Is that ever frustrating when you create something, spend a lot of time creating something and it, it doesn't make the final movie? Yep. Well, <laughs> so we, we all work towards the vision of the director. And I think yeah. the editor and Tim, they made the wise choice. You didn't need to see the, the, the reaction like one, two, you cut on, bam, the reaction, which it's is what boot. made it so effective. So you're making it's a, a boot film, cut. not making an effect. For yeah, I mean, and it, it's a problem with a lot of just artists in general. They, they fall in love with the piece, but they forget the, the function of it. Like people ask us, you know, are you disappointed that you don't have the clown heads anymore? Well, you know, the clown heads were made to be in that movie. And like a lot of things we built, that we build things for their purpose on the movie. And they live in that purpose in that movie. So um, that, that's really what it's all about. What's more hurtful is when you build something and they don't even shoot it. Yeah. And that never gets to be on screen. That's and, frustrating. Yeah. yeah. And and that happened to us on one occasion. Yeah. You know? where you, all your efforts, all your efforts and all your money. When you put the entire budget into an effect, you don't make any money because you want to see it on the screen for a lot of other reasons. And it's cut out of the film. And I think that happened to us a number of times, one time in particular. And we kind of stepped back from what we were doing. And we said, let's reassess why we're here in Los Angeles. We're not here to make great effects for other people's w- movies. We're here to make our own movies. And that started us on a on a trip to making our own films. What was that movie? If you, or don't you want to talk about it? Uh, no, we can't. Alva Piyun did a film called Radioactive Dreams. 
<coughs> contracted to make a 15 foot mechanical rat, a live radioactive rat, and it was 15 feet tall, pneumatically controlled. It Actually, we made two of them. Made oh, the, made the, the 15 foot version and then a close up head in the same and, scale. Yeah. And when we were shooting the climax of the movie, where the rat got the villain and they were a big, big climax, the night they were shooting it, they knew they were cutting it out of the film. And they only set up the shoot specifically for promotion. They had the news cameras down there covering the event of this movie being made. Uh, and we knew it was not going to be in the film. And it wasn't. Not the big rat was not in the movie. And we said, why the hell? We spent all this money, all our time and effort on something. And that's not what we wanted to spend our time on. Yeah, maybe maybe we'll be able to show because we have VHS of the rehearsals, like all studios do. And sometimes that's the best stuff you ever you ever seen of a creature, you know, because we take the time and stuff. We had a stunt person in the mouth of this. Uh, she strapped in, in the mouth of the giant rat. It went down from the ground level, went all the way up 15 feet, thrashing her around with the arm whipping around and then th threw her down and was shaking around like a shark, tearing somebody apart. It was an amazing test. When we finished the test, her husband, the stunt coordinator said, that's too dangerous. If the hand hit her, it would have knocked her head off. If, you know, this thing could break her neck from, you know, the force of this thing going up and down. She was fine, mm -hmm. but when it came to the night of the shoot, we had to keep the hand to the side the head could only go like this, and it could only go like this. So what we shot that night was pathetically unusable, especially the fact that the character was not in the mouth, was dead already, supposedly. The the, the uh, director said, now nah, she'll be dead. We could have put a dummy in the mouth. Yeah, Compound it didn't all just, the things that go wrong. It was just for the... Uh for the video crew was there from one of those, you know, weekly entertainment magazine shows to get some B-roll footage to, pr to promote the film because it, it wasn't going to be in the movie. Not the movie. And then various cuts, ver different versions have different elements of it in the movie. But for the most part, it's nowhere near what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be like, um, you know, TikTok, the, the, the crocodile from Peter Pan. It was okay. going to show yeah. up periodically throughout the movie. And then save the day in the end or have some big, big effect on, on the yeah. outcome. So it was really great. It was a really wonderful prop. I even went on a ride. There's some video of me in the mouth going for a ride. Yes. In it. it was great, like an amusement park ride. It was yeah, really I would like great. to see this. <laughs> uh, my friend Joe Castro does effects, and he also made the Terror Tunes movies. He always says it's frustrating if he makes a cool monster or whatever from someone and they don't know how to shoot it properly has that ever happened uh, well that's the biggest thing that, that's the biggest thing uh you're, you're <laughs> designated to second unit um you know second unit and you have a list of shots that has to be done and they just they want to rush through the thing um you see actors and actresses get 30 takes to deliver a simple line Yet we're coordinating five, six people to bring a puppet to life, this huge mechanical thing, and we have to do it in one or two takes. All right, we got it. Moving on. We said, no, no, no. We're just warming up. Let us do it again. Yeah, That's so, the so, often thing. We're, we're, so often we're relegated to second unit, and so wow. we're not working with the director of the movie. We're working with a, uh, you know, a second unit director. In many cases are, are good and fine. Yeah. You know, on the rare cases we do get to work for, with first unit, it's usually – Friday night, last setup of the night before everybody wants to go home. So yeah. so there's kind of the rush. So that I mean, that's just that's not just us. I mean, that's pretty universal. I think you know, with just about every special effects team, there's uh, you know, we're we're not the big bucks, you know. Yeah, and and also sometimes uh, we do build something. We built some uh, animatronic costumes for a, a TV show. And it was really groundbreaking automatronic controllers. We we pro pre-programmed all these yeah. great facial expressions. And then they went to shoot it in Canada. We couldn't go to Canada. They hired a local crew, and all they did was push the buttons like this. They weren't able to utilize what we built to give the really outstanding performances that it could have done. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yeah, we did something cool, but it wasn't really fulfilled with the performance that was actually captured on the show. Eh, that happens.
Yeah, there's so many things that, that can go wrong that are out of your control. You have a plan to do something, and things change. You know, A lot of filmmaking is problem-solving. You have to think on your feet. You're constantly solving something. Something comes up, something's not working. You sort of have to put your heads together and come up with a solution. It's what's exciting about it. You know, Now everything is fixed in post, which has its, you know, which is, is good in its own way. But um, you know what? Uh, it, it's, it's neat. To, it was neat to have been on the set in the '80s and try to figure things out as you go as you went along. Yeah. Uh, when I had Tom Savini on, he said the same thing. The most fun he had in his career was trying to come up with ideas on how to invent this stuff. And and now yeah. you know you kind of know how certain things are done. <clears throat> but, um, how did the rise of CG affect you guys as making you know effects? Like I kind of think practicals made a comeback in a lot of stuff, but there were for a while everything was CG. People yeah, love we practical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a resurgence in that. You're right. I remember in the '80s we were doing stop motion animation as a special effect, and then when uh, in the '90s when uh, CG became the new shiny toy for producers, everything that we were doing in stop motion went to CG. So there was a really kind of a a, a flat. Uh, bit of business for us there, but we were involved in so many different things. We did uh, animatronic costumes and puppetry, so we always kept our company alive, and it was really wonderful. In the uh, I guess the arts in the early two thousands, there was this resurgence. Kids that were growing up watching the eighties movies had an affinity for an appreciation for the films of the eighties and the, and the traditional techniques, and we can see it's in full swing right now. People like John Favreau, who loves traditional effects. And he's mixing the two. So now it's really the best of both worlds. You've got traditional effects that are shot live, but then you can augment it, change, and, and do extra things to it in CG or yeah, in post-production. Just, just the advent of uh, rig removal and wire <laughs> removal, that sort of thing, is now where we would have to build a sophisticated mechanism that was contained within a puppet. Now we could get rid of all of that and just attach a rod to an arm and then have all this great flexible movement and nuance and precision that we didn't have before. And then we just, you shoot a clean plate and we don't even need to do that anymore. Um, you know, and then yeah. they could remove that, those performers and those rigs. We, we uh, called so it uh, a bag of tricks. The bag of tricks in the eighties was different than the bag of tricks we have now, but we have a bigger bag of tricks now. So you can do digital. We can see the value of that. It simplifies. You don't have to do hand rotoscoping. You've got amazing after effects programs. You can do amazing stuff and explosions. Um, you know, something as simple as, you know, if you have to spend weeks doing animatronic eye blinks, that maybe if you looked at a character, it blinks twice on the screen. You could save thousands of dollars, go to post and have them blink you know, in, in post-production. So you have to be able to use your bag of tricks properly. Yeah, we've always embraced that. technology. At every juncture, we've yeah. kind of, like I think, uh, Elf was the last time we ever shot 35 millimeter film. Yeah. In the late 90s, we were experimenting with digital photography, capturing our animation with digital cameras. And we've always kind of stayed on that cusp, yeah. which is why we've been around as long as we have. I and mean, we've been around since 1981. Mm -hmm. Uh, Julie Hapney, also a uh, effects artist, friend of mine. Did something happen in your childhood that led to the cotton candy-like cocoons? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I, you know, it's really funny. We we, we reference, I think, um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers with those cocoons. But even earlier, there was a Roger Corman film called uh, The Beast from the Haunted Cave, yeah. which I think bar uh, aliens borrowed something from it. And there was a spidery, creepy monster thing in the caves and it actually wrapped up people in cocoons, uh, in these spidery cocoons. Uh, and that was great. And also, uh, it the terror from beyond space. You know, uh, the guy got trapped in between these machines down below, and the beast would get him. He's trapped, and, and it would actually suck the blood out of these people. So it's really a combination of a lot of horror movies we saw, sci-fi and horror. It's all there, all the references. But no, nothing traumatic like being attacked. Yeah. <laughs> you weren't sure stuck in the back. cotton candy <laughs> yeah. machine or anything. Well, it's yeah, we just put a uh, what we call a co cotton uh, a candy coated kill to all our kills. That it was deadly, but it had like a comic kind of twist to it. Yeah, the the, uh, the the fact that people are dying is you know is, is the reality, but we made it so that the absurdity of it made it funny you know you know that and, and we have a whole bunch and you're you know you wonder well 
do we have to do a sequel to a killer clown from outer space? There's so much that was left undone. We've just seen the tip of the iceberg of the killer clown universe. It's funny oh. where most horror films, uh, <laughs> the audience's reactions is a gasp. Ours is a laugh. Yeah. But I think those are the two things that are the most uh, <laughs> fun to watch with an audience. Either you gasp or you laugh together. You know, a drama, you know, sit around and cry together. That's not very exciting. But you can, you oh. know, sit around and have an audible. Uh, well, that's how you relieve. That's, that's how you relieve the emotions. You know, you could either scream or you could laugh. Either one is a vent. Which and we kind of we screen. get the best of both worlds, you know. You get this thing, something funny is happening, you know. Oh wow, that's really funny. Huh? They're being wrapped up in cotton candy. Then, you're, the, then the realization is, oh, you've just lasted at a person's death. And then you <laughs> right, get a right. little bit of a gasp. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'll ask. Well, a lot of these are people just saying that they love the uh, your movies, which is very nice. But uh, here's oh, thank I'll you. ask uh, one more here. Chris Slacks. Uh, when you create the critters, uh, how much uh, how much direction do you get, and how much of it is uh, up to you? What, what design the critters, the critters look like? I guess you know what uh, um, the uh, the screenwriter um, Brian Muir, yeah, Brian Muir, and uh, the director, you know, basically defined it as fur balls with teeth that uh, they look like cute little furry things uh, 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 on the shelf. Given that as a description, just had to come up with something that filled that bill, filled that description, something very simple. And you just, I just, you know, went to all the 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 the, the references of the the Looney Tunes. The Tasmanian Devil came to mind right away from uh, Bugs Bunny, um, and uh, uh, that sort of was the, the 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 jumping point. And then you know, Steve Herrick, the director, and. Uh, I don't know if Brian was involved so much with it, but they picked out the things that they liked. It was quite a few drawings, you know, 30, 40 different sketches. Some went in rat, you know, mode. Some people went, some some of the characters went in a uh, more canine dog, you know, you know, mad dog thing. Then I combined them. And uh, it was ultimately up to, you know, uh, Steve Herrick. And then we refined it in the sculpture when Steven, you know, put it in clay. Yeah, and one of the other yeah, I think specific one of the things was, yeah, no, one of the other specific things was that they they wanted to have arms, but they did not want them to be, you know, yeah. arm centric. You know that they this thing was all about the maw, the mouth. Yeah, yeah it was a mouth. It was really a, a ball with with teeth and mouth, and they didn't want it to be human. They didn't want to have any human anatomy. So the arms came out of the front. They were really tiny. Um, it was really a mouth. The whole thing was a mouth. And the Tasmanian devil, I think, was a, the the perfect kind of takeoff point. For the design it's all mouth yeah we designed it so that you you couldn't put a person in the costume and then bob shea of new line cinema said i want a big monster and actually it was written in there that the more they eat the bigger they grew so they were bigger balls and bigger critters but we didn't realize they wanted a full size six eight foot you know critter in the end and you know it sort of worked against it you know suits you know, have a tendency to be a questionable, you know, uh, thing, you know, uh, and they wound up shooting around it and stuff. It looked like a big, you know, uh, Kool-Aid kid, <laughs> a furry Kool-Aid kid, you know? <laughs> yeah, the Kool-Aid man, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I, we would have rather kept it small. It was, I know we wanted to make it bigger. We like to make, you know, that's why we have Clownzilla at the end of our movie. We like to end our movies with big monsters. But um, it really really the end worked well when it was that big. It looked like a garbage can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because again, such length was taken to make sure that it didn't ever look like a person could be in a suit. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it looked like it had to do. <laughs> I found I found an old drawing, and uh, it was a schematic drawing, and I drew a little person inside a suit with the outline of the thing, and I put a thing on it. Fuck you, Kyoto, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I found the drawing. I actually did that because I know that you know that it was going to be a very painful process for a little person to be. Yeah, but then, then we then we got thing. one of the best you know little per little people in town, Kevin Thompson. Yeah, to Kevin. Be, yeah, and uh, yeah, he did it. He did it the best you could do. You know, that's all. Yeah, we didn't good. kill him. So, well, that's yeah. good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, are you guys working on anything currently? 
Uh, yeah, we have a couple of projects in the work. Nothing that we can talk about, yeah. but we do have a film that's out in the theaters right now, Marcel the Shell with shoes on. Oh, wow. Quite yeah, different I know. Yeah. than the typical genre work we do, but it, we're really proud of the film. It's doing pretty well at the box office, so I would encourage people to, yeah, to yeah. check out that film. I think you'll be very uh, happily surprised. Wonderful. Yeah, we're hoping to get some attention during the award season. Uh, yeah. We just found out that it's going to be uh, it's eligible for nomination in a best animated feature oh, nice. category. Nice. So we're, we're hopeful there and some other oh, cool things right now. Actually, the uh, the game is the is a thing that we're really kind of concentrating on They're They're about to enter, uh, you know, a, a beta testing mode. And, you know, we're, we're seeing new stuff all the time. Uh, Good Shepherd and Terror Vision are releasing a bunch of images publicly. So we're really excited about that. Can't wait for that to come out early next year. And yeah, now the holiday season is coming up. So we produced uh, Alien Christmas for Netflix, oh, a nice. stop motion holiday nice. special with aliens uh, uh, invading the North Pole. Uh, <laughs> it'll be airing again during this holiday season. I'd say everybody should kind of check that out. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 up there, it's, it's up almost Christmas now. moment. I can't believe it. It's it's that season again. I can't yeah. believe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just uh, uh, Halloween just ended, and so was Christmas again. Yeah. yeah, so if people want to check it out, they should look for it's uh, Alien Christmas, but it's uh, Christmas is spelled with an X, so it's Alien Xmas. Okay, and yeah, yeah. unfortunately, you have to search for the Netflix, but it's uh, available right now. Yeah, I didn't know you guys were involved in Marcel. I know that's a twenty four animated movie. I was uh, I actually wanted to see it at the theater, but it, uh, why, why would you not think so with the people who did uh, Team America and uh, Critters and Killer Clowns from Outer Space too. <laughs> yeah, no, we were we were involved with that for a long time. Uh, you know, uh, Dean uh, Fleischer Camp, uh, the, the creative director, Jenny Slate. We've worked on that movie since 2014. Uh, uh, Kirsten Lepore, uh, the animation director. Uh, Steve was the animation supervising animation director. I was the animation producer. We uh, we helped them with Cinereach, who was the actual production company, figure out how to get that movie done, bring uh, Jenny and Dean's vision to the screen. Um, it was a long, incredible process. It's, it's a really wonderful movie. I hope everybody gets to check it out. There are a lot of technical problems that Edward and Steven solved on that one. That was the story was there. The characters were there. It's technically how to do what, what the director had in mind. That was the tough part. Uh, for Team America, did you guys do any of the, the sex scenes with the with the puppets? With the yeah, we guys? did. Yeah. yeah, we did. But uh, I guess we were maybe a little too realistic. So <laughs> Trey said, no, wait, I want it like this. And he yeah. went over there, he grabbed the puppets and he just started going. <laughs> no, he wanted it to is... see like a, a Barbie doll and a Ken doll, you know, just or G.I. Joe, just kind of <laughs> running. Right, right. Yeah, we have footage. We have footage of a, of a, of a reel that Matt and Trey did of how they saw they actually had sticks on Barbie dolls and were actually, they showed us what they wanted. So that exists somewhere, somewhere. Uh, maybe we'll show that sometime. Yeah. The animatic is actually their animatic with Barbie and GI Joe is very close to what the, uh, the finished product is. It's very funny, <laughs> but yeah, we, we ended up doing that three times. The first time just the, the, the naked puppets didn't have enough anatomy on them. So we had to go back and, remake the puppets to you know give uh gary that six pack and everything and then we did it again and we were trying to finesse it make it kind of a tender love making sequence and they said no no and then we uh went back and did it a third time where it was just the, the pure rutting that steven mentioned it was uh, a yeah, trey, trey got up there and just he, he was there there's some photographs of him there on there just going <laughs> laughing a lot of the you know actually not a lot of them but some of the puppeteers the very serious veteran puppeteers, marionette artists, um, they opted out. Yeah, one with our, so our, our, our lead, just a, an amazing puppeteer, a marionette artist. He said, Ed, I don't think I could do this. Is it okay if I sit this out? And we excused him. We said, we won't let you do anything you don't want to do. Uh, that's, a, that's a great story. It's very cool. Well, this has been great. I love talking with you. And it would be cool. Maybe we'll do it again sometime and talk about some of your other work. Anytime. Yeah, yes. Let's do it. Hopefully, we'll have something really cool yeah. uh, under our belts that we'd like to share with you guys. So we'd be more than happy to speak to you again. Yeah. In closing, you know, when, when we, we were always told that comedy and horror, actually several times people said comedy and horror don't mix. And I point out Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and the first Men in Black. When it's done right, 
it works great. And there's an audience for that. So yeah, yeah Sam Raimi oh, started yeah. his career doing great horror comedy. I mean, it's there. You just have to believe yeah. in it. I mean, you can just cash in on regular on the genre saying, oh, just make it hard, just make it scary and scary, more violent. You could go that way, but there's so many variations that I think the audiences will would will accept. And I, I I'm glad we were able to join that. Yeah, and a very similar vibe. Uh, I think the early Sam Raimi and uh, and Killer Clowns it has that Looney Tunes vibe to it, yeah. where it's almost like a live action Looney. No, Tunes. we grow up. We sort of grew up watching Sam Raimi, so you know we're big fans. So what you do is you take the best and you you you, you make it, uh, you reinvent it, and uh, you know you know just do it again. Yeah. yeah, and even a lot of stuff like America Werewolf in London. I mean, it's yeah. horror, but it's it's. I would call it a horror comedy. There's a lot of great horror comedies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, the characters mm-hmm. very engaging, and you find the humor in those characters. And but again, that one, you know, it goes off. It's the, yeah. the circumstances are real. People are dying. I think, you know, his horrible. his buddy coming back as a zombie progressively. I think all that. That, that was a brilliant was performance. Great. Griffin Dunn as uh, yeah. you know, as his buddy coming back and counseling him as, as a as a corpse. That was brilliant. I thought that was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and having yeah. Rick Baker aboard isn't too shabby. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard of that guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks, guys. It's been great. Thank All you, right. Neil. Yeah. Thank Where you. Where can people Take follow care. the Kyoto Brothers? They could probably just put in Kyoto Brothers and find you. But yeah, you know, our Facebook page is probably the most uh, current information. Uh, you know, for us. Yeah, each of us have a, a Facebook page, and there's a company Kyoto Brothers. Yeah, Kyoto Brothers. Page. Yeah, you can see a lot of what we're up to. Oh. Very good. And one last question. Uh, I, I I like to look up on Google. Like, I just find it funny sometimes, like what people ask about the movie. And the number one question that came up for Killer Clowns is, is Killer Clowns from Outer Space supposed to be scary? That's the number one question people Google for Killer Clowns, which I just found very amusing. It's as scary as you want it to be. Yeah. I I find it odd that someone would Google that and not just come to the conclusion themselves. Themselves, yeah. 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 No, it depends on the audience, because some people are terrified. Some people think it's it's hilarious. So it's it's good. You know, everybody takes it in their own way. You know, so. Thanks, guys. Oh, go on. Okay, take care. Yep. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thanks.